very, very welcome to Tender Transformation sneak launch of our podcast and also our knowledge platform where we offer training in tenderness as tool for and engine for transformative practices. My name is Penilla Glaser and I'm here with two people who are very invested in transformation and I will soon tell you who they are. Tender transformation understands tenderness as a practice of nonviolence, self-empathy, trust and collaboration. And this is what we are exploring in our podcast that you can see live recorded here today from the Swedish Book Fair, the Global Square, and that you can encounter in our trainings. And we will have two more conversations at this book fair, and you can be present at the following. So tomorrow, 9.30, I will have a conversation with Ola Matson and John Paul Saccarini at the main stage at the book fair. And tomorrow at uh, quarter to two, Rebecca Vintagen will have a conversation with me and Eva Horowitz. So if you are in Gothenburg, you can be present. And you can also watch and listen to us or just wait for the pod to be launched properly. One sister and one brother, both working with transformative practices, resistance and exploration of how we can co-create new futures together. Stellan Vintagen is the endowed chair in the study of nonviolent direct action and civil resistance, professor of sociology at the University of Massachusetts, and also researcher actually here in Gothenburg at the Department of Social and Behavioral Studies. And at the School of Global Studies, University of Gothenburg, also leading the resistance studies program. And maybe one of few academics who have uh, hosted an academic conference while protesting against nuclear uh, warfare and uh, being arrested in the process. The latest book from Stella Vintagen is co-written with Anna Johansson and looks at everyday resistance, which is one thing that we will touch on in this conversation. Rebecca Vintagen, lecturer, method developer and process leader, has worked a lot with issues reg regarding leadership and how artistic staging can be used in transformative practices. Also a teacher, working with norm creative perspectives in different processes, and the initiator of the app Micro Action Movement, which is about everyday actions to change the world and last but definitely not least, the co-creator of Tender Transformation. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. Welcome, Stellan. Thank and you. thank you for tuning in from the other side of the world. So I have already told you what my first question will be in this conversation, where we will unpack in 45 minutes some perspectives of what transformation can mean and how tenderness links into that. But my first question is, what are your thoughts when you think about tenderness uh, as uh, um, a tool for or a vehicle for transformative practices? And I thought I'd start with you, Stellan. Where do your mind go on that? Thank you. Um, well, I'm thinking about Gandhi and his principle uh, not only about nonviolence, um, but uh, the principle of sarvodaya, which means the welfare of all, um, where you are taking into account everyone um, involved, um, in, even in a conflict, um, the welfare of everyone. I'm also thinking about how one of the most renowned uh, academics of today, Judith Butler, is emphasizing how nonviolence needs to be uh, understood as our vulnerability, mm. the vulnerability of life. Mm. Beautiful. 
I thought we could come back to vulnerability in a little while. Um, interesting. Um, so there's a little uh, hiccup, technical hiccup, but uh, welcome um, back, Stella. You hear me now? Yes, we hear you perfectly. Vulnerability. Right. So um, Judith Butler's um, point is that life is vulnerable. So um, um, some, some individuals might believe that uh, they don't need others, particularly young, white, male people tend to think that they are individual. But we are all dependent. Um, so the vulnerability of life as such on water and transport and food and, and um, love and care mm. is fundamental for life. So that's what I'm thinking, that when we are transforming, we need to take that into account. Mm. Great. And I, I thought we'd come back in a little while to this, let's call it the, the practice of codependency uh, for now, uh, because uh, I, that is important, I think, when we move into talking about how we can collaborate and co-create between experiences. But first, Rebecca, where do you, where do you think? What about this? Where does your mind go? With tenderness and transformation? Mm, yes. Well, for me, I think uh, tenderness has everything to do uh, with transformation. If we want this sort of long-term uh, change, we need to, to put tenderness in the center of our processes, both for our self-care, but also for our care uh, for each other, for all, like uh, Stellan is quoting. And I, I was also actually thinking about uh, Gandhi, when you asked this question, like be the change that you want to see in the world. Mm. So if we want another world where we do uh, uh, share this codependency that Butler is talking about, uh, then we need to do it also with uh, tender towards each other. So we can also create these rooms with each other where we can test ways of living together and organize ourselves uh, together mm. where there is this holistic view for the whole human being to be. Uh, I'm on my way to this codependency practices that you're also very invested in, Stella. But I just want to ask you, Rebecca, on that note, uh, you worked with a lot of different organizations and groups, and most people have, have a space for tenderness in their lives. So they have important relationships, or they care for their garden or something. Uh, but what is it that hinders us from sort of bringing this with us into the spaces where we interact with others at work or in other situations where we where we want to push for change or or deliver something together well i think one of the things is our perception of what it is to be professional that then we leave that side of ourselves outside the room or we think that we do of course our emotions and and this experience also um, affect our work but it's not something that we bring that we bring in as a, as a contribution uh, mm -hmm. to our workplaces for example or our processes so i think that can very much hinder us from mm -hmm. taking this knowledge uh, that, and the care that we would take in a private situation, in a dinner, to make sure that everybody uh, will speak around mm -hmm. the table and making their voice heard. We don't have the same attention to this when we're sitting in a meeting mm -hmm. always. We don't think that it counts. No, we mm -hmm. don't think that it counts. Mm -hmm. And we don't realize the, the, um, the very important information that is given to us when we also uh, are aware and in contact with uh, the tenderness mm. in the room. Mm. Thank you. I, I I want to I want to talk a little bit about this uh, uh, codependency knowledge, and I would like to ask you, Stalin, about uh, this from two perspectives. And you can you can choose <laughs> your favorite, or you can speak about both <laughs> because they're they're connected. Uh, so in the book uh, where you look at everyday resistance, you also speak about how the re field, the research field of resistance and conflict also can, can benefit a lot from uh, working together with other fields 
uh, and you sort of underline that this is not one question or one issue we need to sort of move between. This is about governance and this is about psychology and there are di many different perspectives to this. So, so one part of my question is about how can we talk about change and transformation and, and really have a multitude of perspectives uh, so sort of stay away from this one-eyed view. And the other part of the question, which perhaps is the same thing, is how do we bring in more, more different kinds of experiences? How do we work with activists and research, for example, which you have done a lot? What, what kind of co-dependency or co-dependent knowledges can rise out of that? So how do we sort of stay in this multitude of perspectives? How do we need to work? I think it's um, fundamental to uh, start with the problems uh, and the um, mutual interests for social change. Um, so if, if you're interested in, in problems around injustices or poverty in the world, um, you realize that the problems are interdisciplinary. Um, they are never only economic or political uh, or cultural, uh, psychological. They are all at the same time. And you also need to value the particular knowledge that exists from the professors of the street, the, the experienced activists um, that they build up when they are struggling. And the particular kind of theoretical and philosophical and, and, and system knowledge that exists with academics that have the, the privilege of um, spending their whole work time in, in reading and comparing cases in history. So when, when you acknowledge this, um, you have a foundation for, for um, collaboration across knowledge traditions you know, the social science knowledge tradition is at, at our universities are only one particular kind of knowledge tradition. There are other, uh, like indigenous knowledge traditions um, <clears throat> that are fundamentally different. And I think we can meet around the issues around the problems and, and our mutual interest. So we quickly realize that we need to be global, we need to be interdisciplinary when we are working and trying to understand uh, these things. And I also think that this actually links to tender transformation in the way that um, you will realize that the problem is not individuals, uh, the problem is uh, about systems, institutions and structures that needs to change. And those things, you don't change with violence against individuals. You change that through creating alternative systems, alternative institutions and structures, and by undermining and changing the systems that exist today. And that is a collective, nonviolent work. I'll thank you. And I'll come back very shortly <laughs> with a question about uh, what that can look like, because I'm thinking about uh, different sort of, uh, sorry for coming back to you, Rebecca, with basically a version of the same question I asked before. But it's uh, it's interesting how we also, we had uh, Thalens talking about different knowledge traditions, mm. and, and also we have different sort of rules of conduct in different mm. settings. Mm. So how do we, how, what is your experience of how we can sort of negotiate these roles or this, agendas so that we can start to have this conversation about the actual problems um, how do you how do you think around around that what is what is important how do we do that uh, in a meeting what is what is most important for us to be able to to come together yeah well i think one of those things is this active listening a little bit like stellan also talking about the 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 realization of the knowledge production can happen and look very different in different uh, cultures, but also in different groups, and if you're inside or outside of institutions. So to recognize that, that we have those people that stands on the barricades that never compromises, and we have those people that work within change within the institutions where it's a lot slower processes, but they are both needed. And, and uh, I think to have that mutual respect for each other. 
and um, also use uh, intersectionality in a solidaric way, like not agreeing to putting needs against each other, competing with each other, but actually listening to our needs and see, okay, so how can we find solutions where everybody is free then? How, how has the, the, the work with artistic practices uh, assisted you as a facilitator in, in assisting groups and yeah. individuals in doing this, opening this? Uh, alternative space because when Stellan talks about the alternative system and structure is also sort of an alternative way of working together yeah potentially and as Stellan was saying mm. as well what what we have to do is to give alternatives mm. and that's where I think the culture has an amazing mm. potential it's like one of my favorite uh, authors Adrian Marie Brown talks about that we have all the facts what we need now is longing mm. Uh, and of course, to be uh, to be reminded of this, that we can at any point decide to organize the way we're living uh, in any way that we want to. To be reminded of that, and there the culture can help us to show these different settings of how we could also live our lives. And I, I coined this phrase, norm creativity, mm. because I had this longing for this, like in, in Sweden it's a term of, of norm critical, there's sort of a, an, an umbrella for a lot of post-colonial and, and queer and feminist mm. uh, theories where we sort of problematize what is the norm, but we can also get stuck in this critical position of being mm. against. Mm. Well, uh, it's a lock. It's a lockdown, mm. exactly. Mm. So I instead of thinking, okay, what is it that we're actually for? Can mm. we unite at least under temporary truths mm. <laughs> of something that we yeah. work towards. And then the, the culture settings can allow us to test. To play. And play. Mm. Uh, and uh, have that sort of tenderness with mm. each other and allow ourselves to, uh, to test out different ideas. Let's come back a little bit more in a while to, to what that can look like mm. in, in, uh, in different contexts. But I would like to ask Stellan about this. How do we... How, how can we uh, help each other to unpack the stories and knowledges that we have? How can we invite each other? What kind of conversations uh, do you feel are essential for us to step into and not start to understand each other's particular knowledges or, or experiences? Well, I think a, a beginning, as I said, is, is around uh, the um, problems that we all face and the mutual interest in, in caring for the vulnerability of life. Um, but then I think we need to recognize it takes time and the building of relationships and trust. Um, for me, as a white academic from, <clears throat> from Europe and, and working in the United States, I have to recognize that it takes time to build trust and relationships to indigenous communities and, and um, black liberation groups, um, of course, because mm. it's very embarrassing, but I, I work within an institution that is very white, um, that has a very strong imperial history of connection to supporting state war and, and um, all kinds of repression. So when you build that kind of personal relations um, <clears throat> and you, st you understand the knowledge that other people have, you will develop capacity to translate, particularly if you also work together, um, both in the research of trying to understand things better, but primarily in trying to change together. Mm. And I think there is this kind of um, possibility, but you have to invest time and the building of trust. Mm. That's this this idea of sort of giving things time or taking things slowly, building things organically. It's it's almost a, like a revolutionary idea in and of itself in the in a time where we're sort of supposed to also uh, shows show something that has been produced out of every occasion. So how do you how do you think about this sort of 
the pressure that's also in the world of research that, you know, uh, produce something, show something that comes out of this. And sometimes the building of personal relationships doesn't work like that. It's a more slow, explorative things. Well, we, we have to, to um, on the one hand, see that um, it takes time. Uh, on the other hand, um, there is this need to work on very tangible, uh, concrete, practical projects together. Um, so one thing that I'm doing right now is that I'm connecting people that live in seven different um, territories where they are currently under military occupation and colonialism like uh, Western Sahara, Palestine, Tibet, and West Papua, and Kashmir, and Puerto Rico, Ambazonia, and so on. So, so what happens is that they are talking to each other across these territories to learn from each other, and they find that very useful. Uh, they haven't been in a space before uh, that is created uh, where they can um, talk across so many uh, places that have similar experiences, mm. but very unique contexts at the same time. Mm. So this is very useful for the activists. Mm. It's very practical. Mm. Um, at the same time, we're building knowledge together. Yeah, and, and we have been meet meeting like this for one and a half year. Mm. And you're also sort of inventing a role for for the researcher as the facilitator of of a space for others. Yes. Mm. Uh, I, I, I want to, to come back to what kind of, I want to come back to a little bit to, to what, what, how we can understand resistance, which is not exactly the same as transformation, but definitely a huge part of transformation. So uh, what, what can be considered resistance and what can be considered transformation. But I just want to ask you, Rebecca, about this uh, the, the facilitating of the space, because that's mm -hmm. also something you do a lot from from a, another perspective and departure point. And and I would like to, to hear you talk a little bit more about what kind of tools that you bring to this space on the, the artistic practice as toolbox uh, to help people to, to, to exchange their knowledges and, may, and, and allow for their experience to count. Mm. Uh, so do you mean like actual uh, yeah, settings? Just, yeah, yeah. What, what, what can it look like or what is important? Uh, well, we did, uh, for example, um, one cooperation together with Greenpeace mm. uh, that we called All Set for Change, where we uh, turned towards the Finance Institute uh, with the goal of a fossil-free uh, finance mm. uh, sector. Mm. And, and there we also had this sort of norm, uh, creative perspective in that sense of, you know, we're coming with an open hand and we're setting in, uh, showing settings of things that we would prefer instead. Mm. So, for example, um, every year in Sweden, the finance minister do this budget walk where mm. they walk in with a budget for the next year mm. uh, to the parliament mm. and uh, all the journalists mm. is, uh, are there and so on. So It's a very sort of set ritual. It's a very very set ritual, mm. yeah, and all the press is mm. there and you're presenting how we're going to, um, yeah, use our common mm. money uh, for the next year. And so there, for example, we did an alternative uh, budget walk where we had collected lots of the, the big and small organizations within the environmental movement in Sweden uh, and lots of very concrete different suggestions that, that they had that needs to be done uh, for us to, to follow the, the Paris Agreement. Mm. Uh, and then we actually staged like we had our, uh, our own finance ministers and we had our own uh, environmental mm. gods then instead of security gods uh, and so on. So we did this, this very mm. similar yeah. ritual just 10 minutes before the finance mm. minister. So once we got to the to the parliament, the, the, the sort of the real press, we also had mm. activists that mm. were uh, dressed up as journalists, but uh, came running towards us because mm. they thought it was the, the finance minister mm. coming, for yeah. example. But then we could also hand over these very concrete examples mm. of uh, or, and suggestions, mm. of real suggestions mm. uh, that we need to do within mm. our budget. Mm. 
And, and that could be one way also of working with this to keep this. I, I think that's important. That is one of the big values also to show what we are for, mm. because it also gives us a different breathing and a different setting when mm. we come into this situation. Yeah. We don't, we're not there to go on the attack yeah. or have five exclamation marks yeah. after you have your every own party. sentence. We have our own party. We're centers mm. around this. Mm. We know this is important. So we, we, we're reaching out mm. our hand mm. to the finance minister with this. Beautiful. So, but. What, what what is your experience of the sort of the idea of transformation? Because I'm thinking that this is also a way of showing this is this is some this is what something else can look like. Yeah. And I'm thinking about this the distance between the fact and the longing mm -hmm. as you quoted, uh, and and sort of how how we might have constructed ideas about this is this counts mm -hmm. as transformation mm -hmm. and this is doesn't count as transformation and and what that is and what is your your experience when you work with this also with these artistic practices mm. how people can understand or maybe renegotiate their understanding of transformative practices yeah because I, I think it's interesting i love the word transformation mm -hmm. i was thinking a little bit before when you talked mm -hmm. about this that it can be revolutionary for things mm -hmm. to take time mm -hmm. i think it's especially revolutionary when it comes to privileged people to have to slow down yeah. and take their time because of course we have a lot of issues like the environment but also a lot of, of uh, resistant issues and uh, things to do with mm -hmm. equality that is very urgent uh, of course at the same time so it's very easy to long for a revolution uh, that for me can also become very just replacing one system with another. Tran transformation for me means also more uh, an holistic view, mm. a transformation of our whole mindset mm. towards each other and within each other. So and it's a deep change. It's a deeper change, yeah. Mm. And that's why I like mm. very much when mm. we landed in this tender transformation mm. because it connects these two together. Mm. I, I'll come back to you with questions in a little while about how we take how we can take small steps towards deep transformation. Yeah. Without sort of taking a year out from work and that that's of course also uh, for some people a possibility. Yeah. But 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 what the small steps looks like. But I would like to ask you, Stalin, about the, the relationship between resistance and transformation in in your view, uh, because I I have the sense that resistance also have all, a lot of different ideas surrounding it of this is this counts as resistance or this is not real resistance and so on and so forth so what what your take is on how how resistance or the, the role of resistance in transformation why is it important or how can it be important uh, for for transformative practices well i'm very inspired by um, gandhi and his approach here um where the idea is that if you if you live in a society where there are systematic injustices and oppression of, of different kind, you need to do three things at the same time. And, and the, the key is that you're doing them at the same time. And that is that you have to undermine the, the oppressive, violent system that exists. That's the resistance part. That needs to be done individually and collectively. And you also need to create now alternatives that are not violent, that are different kinds of systems. Uh, so you experiment with the alternatives within your movement and in the struggle. That's the second part. The third part is that you need to also work on the, your personal transformation and the transformation of individuals within the struggle. Because it also happens that the... Uh, when we grow up within a systematic, racist, homophobic um, society filled with violence, we are also formed as individuals by this. We internalize the violence within us. So you cannot avoid any of these three. And, and for me, it's, it's fundamental that we understand that resistance is not something that is directed against individuals or use of violence, uh, because it's a matter of undermining um, the possibilities of war, injustices um, and, and oppression. And that has to do with how we are coll collectively organized. 
And I mean, even even a revolutionary like Che Guevara that was organizing armed struggle emphasized how love is the primary motivation force of a revolutionary. Mm. So I think there has to be this um, focus on um, a change that is willing to take risk and and confront and undermine the violence and and injustices that's the resistance part Mm. at the same time as we are carried by visions of a different society and that we recognize that we as individuals we are also part of the problem and solution at the same time Mm. so this is again the codependency it's the also the relation relational way of working very much that you Describe here. Sorry. No, I, I just wanted to uh, to connect to that personal transformation because I also think it's very easy that we think up here we're doing this intellectually. I was thinking mm-hmm. when you asked before how the culture setting can also help us with this to bring in our body <laughs> into the mm-hmm. system as well because of course we're staging these power relations in our body as well. We yeah. train how we behave in different rooms, mm-hmm. and and uh, we can restage. We can restage, mm-hmm. and we can as also get a lot of help from our uh, our bodies and props and scenography mm-hmm. that where we are. Acting within Mm -hmm. to also find different channels within ourselves Mm -hmm. and other alternatives and also like you were saying Stella when we're trying out these different alternatives Mm -hmm. or ways of of organizing ourselves Mm -hmm. then I think these bodily practices are often forgotten Mm -hmm. and maybe not again seen as real resistance Mm -hmm. in the same way Mm -hmm. so And and this is and this is particularly important for us that uh, are born into privileges. Um, people that live in poverty and marginalization, uh, they know that they, they need to uh, join up together uh, and collectively support mm-hmm. each other to survive. Um, but we can have this temptation that uh, we can solve it through um, quick solutions, through... Um, violence and 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 the state and so on and we don't have to go through ourselves no. we um, can stay in the sort of bubbles yeah yeah i want to ask uh about uh two things uh seems to be my thing to ask <laughs> two things at the same time uh but one thing is about uh the minute the things that are can be overlooked or not regarded as important and the other thing is about uh, how do we talk about things that we can't talk about? Sorry for the philosophical twist here, but I'll explain my question. So in uh, in uh, Everyday Resistance, the book that you wrote with, with Anna Johansson, uh, you talk about, um, you refer to infrapolitics, the sort of stuff that, that we can do uh, as, a, as a way of protesting. Uh, that are not uh, identified necessarily as such. Uh, sarcasm or being passive uh, that that might not be like, good, you're, you're part of a resistance movement, not recognize as such, but it, it might be. So how do we, so that is sort of one part of my question. How do we, how do we capture or recognize these fragments of resistance or, or transformative uh, in engagements and how do we how do we find words and language uh, for that that is fragmented and minute and sparse? so what do you what do you think around that Stellan? yeah this is very important because um, we tend to because of the focus of mass media the state and and um, the normal kind of research we tend to look at um, uh, pol- politics as a matter of politicians and a matter of what happens on the street in very dramatic confrontations. Um, but the thing is, with everyday resistance, is that uh, everybody is doing their micro actions in their everyday, um, at the workplace, in the family, in the neighborhood, uh, all the time. Um, but it's not organized necessarily in a formal organization, but people are doing these kind of things because they react against what 
injustices they meet. Uh, that could be by working slower when they feel exploited or to borrow things at their workplace or to, or to use their work time to do private things. Um, and all this makes all of us into activists, all of us part of the social change work. And, and I think once we recognize that this is going on, uh, we can... Hmm. You, you froze thing. for us a little bit here. So I'm going to mm -hmm. listen to what you have to say about this for now. If you're not, Yeah, you're back. Now you're back. Okay. <laughs> so please I'm, finish. I'm s sorry for this. No, no um, worries. So uh, once we identify that this uh, everyday politics is going on in an invisible way, uh, where millions of people are doing uh, that, that's a beginning. The, mm -hmm. the second part I would say is that we start to have um, um, efforts to, to coordinate and, and create communication between these individuals that are doing these things. Um, th this is a very um, powerful form of resistance and activism because people are able to do it in a way that is not recognized as resistance uh, or activism. Um, but the, the weakness is that it's so scattered among individuals. So that's where this um, very creative uh, smartphone app that my sister developed um, is so important, the MicroAction Movement app. Mm. We're going we're gonna to talk a bit, little bit about MicroActions. Um, we don't have eons of time left. But I just want to ask you what you your take is on this, and particularly how do we how do we find a way to talk about this mm. different fragmented? Ways. Yeah, because I was actually mm. also going to connect yeah. it a little yeah. bit to to this app, Microaction Movement, that has this underline everyday actions mm. to change the world, mm. to to actually put those everyday resistance in that context yeah. that is often this. Uh, because it's very easy when we think about civil courage and so on that we think or in, in armed conflicts. But of course, we're constantly, all of us, upholding human rights and democracy mm. together all the time. And to, to frame it like that and to, to um, make it visible, mm. how many. So I should just say, so, so this app is um, has it's a completely non-commercial app mm. and it has contributions from... Um, in Sweden, over 50 NGOs mm. and uh, people from the culture and environmental sector that gives mm. you suggestions of micro actions that you could do for today, like just eat vegetarian food or mm. uh, sign yeah. up as a volunteer here uh, and so on. And I, I think that is one way of making this everyday resistance um, visible. visible. Yeah. Exactly, and putting it in a context, and of course now we're going to launch it in, in the US together with the University of Massachusetts, and then we also think when we get this on broad scale, we can also show the statistics so you can see how many more people mm. around the world that are doing this yeah. uh, micro actions to also give it that bigger perspective mm. of your everyday um, uh, actions, because of course a lot of... Um, Resistance, often effective resistance, is also preventative when we are one step ahead mm. than <laughs> after the fact. Mm. Uh, Can you say a little bit more on that? Yeah, because uh, first of all, yeah. uh, when I was going to saw this app, mm. I wanted to do an app for civil courage. Mm. And of course, we connect civil courage uh, to very much acting. Something, um, something happens on the tube, mm. somebody says mm. something racist, yeah. go in and intervene, which is, of course, very much connected and, and is very much demanding civil courage in many ways. But, but to think about the preventative parts of yeah. these things that we can do before somebody actually think mm. it's okay to say something mm. like that out mm. loud on the tube. Yeah. So yeah. if we change our culture, if we part take part in changing our culture, yes, this this and this and this might not ha yeah. occur. This more yeah. long term. Yeah. And to really lower the threshold, because I think it's also connected to what you said before, what is real uh, mm. resistance mm. and what is mm. not. So it can hinder us if we don't identify as an activist, like it's either full time mm or you do nothing at all, but to mm. really uh, lower those thresholds and also to uh, think of creativity. It doesn't have to be a, a contradiction to human rights, no. for example. 
we can still find ways that for ourselves are creative and mm. doable mm. and something that I can actually do now. So mm. we don't get stuck in discussions. We actually come mm. to real action. Mm. So we have five minutes and left. And uh, and uh, yeah, you, you, will be, you will be speaking very soon. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that we have five minutes left. Yes, good. And uh, before you start to say what you are going to say, I also want to add the question to you, Stalanon. Uh, what your what what your everyday action, if you share one thing today, uh, would be on taking this the step to this this relational way of working that we have been talking about. So whatever you were going to say, and the answer to that, please. <laughs> yes, I can combine these things. I um, knew it. <laughs> um, so the app. And, and our approach to everyday um, activism is, is uh, also a matter of reclaiming our capacity to uh, work with social change. Um, you know, people tend to, in their public actions on the street, to be very focused on protest. But protest is a matter of appealing to the government to make the change for us. Whereas the app and our approach is much more informed by direct action, which is that we try to solve the problems ourselves. Mm. And for example, um, today I'm going to uh, go out and harvest wild rice, which is one of the few indigenous um, grains that exist in, in, the, in the US together with corn. And that is an indigenous tradition um, that we are participating in. And by doing that, we are also spreading the wild rice to um, uh, more places. So that is, uh, instead of, of uh, asking for protection of, of uh, the nature, we are participating in, in, um, in nurturing it. Mm. And... Um, that is a direct action. It's it's a very everyday thing. It's it's very um, non-dramatic. It's mm. not recognized as politics, but it's part of the indigenous food mm. uh, systems that needs to uh, be developed. Mm. Great, thank you. Uh, and I will ask you uh, the same question with a little add-on, uh, because I'm thinking that a lot of the 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 tenderness that we show each other uh, in our lives is often we do something so we can do something else. We drink tea so we can talk about uh, how we feel <laughs> uh, and, and so on. We, we build something and while we build it we figure out how to, to save the world and so on. So, so what is your thought on this, uh, a, a small step for, for transformation that you, that you can see that it could also be, have this quality of doing something while doing something else? Mm. Uh, like harvesting wild rice while doing something else. Yes, we should mm. never underestimate mm. uh, <laughs> fika, as mm. we say in, in mm. Swedish, nope. uh, drinking tea, um, eating together mm. and so on. It's, it's often a very good way mm. of building and rituals as yes. well. This is. But uh, do you have one favorite to share? I have for many today. favorites, but I think one uh, that I touched a little bit upon is this, to really practice active listening, mm. especially if you are in a privileged uh, position, mm. to instead of formulating your own opinion, ask a few extra questions mm. to the person that you're listening to. Mm. Cool, beautiful, thank you so much. So, uh, this is it. Folks, we just started, of course, uh, but thank you so much for for being here. And thank you, Stalan, for being awake during our whole conversation. Tomorrow, My pleasure. Tomorrow, we are going to talk at 9.30 about raging and resting. So how do we balance between uh, screaming at the system and resting and working with sustainability and recovery together? And we're also going to talk about, at a quarter to two, about how do we navigate vulnerability as tool for understanding complexity. So please join us then uh, and uh, listen in or be part with, take part with us on stage. Thank you so much for now. Thank you. And uh, have a good day. <laughs>